a mysterious fire. You must imagine what the intensity of that fire was. Everything was melting, thousands of centigrade degrees. A thing like that can't happen in Monaco. A sanctuary for the super rich. An American caught in the crossfire. I did what I had to do for the safety and love of my family. Sinister forces at play. I saw Iran-Contra affair. I saw Russian mafia. The Chechen terrorists, even Mossad. A death in paradise, and one of the most fascinating cases of my career. Tonight, on Power, Privilege, and Justice. Monaco basks in the warm sun of the Riviera and is home to Prince Albert and the Grand Prix. But race cars and royalty aren't the country's only attractions for the very rich. Monaco is also one of the best places to dodge the tax man and clean up your dirty money. December 3rd, 1999. It's just before dawn, and the residents of this tiny European principality are all tucked into bed. Among the very rich and highly secretive citizens of Monaco is banking billionaire, Edmund Safra. He was the richest man in Monaco after the prince. Safra and his wife Lily owned the largest penthouse in Monte Carlo a vast duplex apartment sitting atop a six-story financial building known as La Belle Epoque. On duty at the ground floor lobby is a concierge. Mrs. Safra sleeps in her own wing of the elaborate residence. Her 67-year-old husband suffers from Parkinson's disease and must have round-the-clock care. Nurse Vivian Torrente is by his side. Suddenly, one of the other nurses, Ted Maher, enters the bedroom with a knife sticking out of his stomach. He tells Safra and Torrente that he's been attacked. Two people have broken into the apartment. I don't know where they're at. Maher explains that as he sat outside the bedroom, someone hit him from behind, but he fought back. The man on the right had pulled out a knife. The knife went central into my abdomen. Maher tells Torrente to get Safra into the bathroom and lock the door. You take Mr. Safra. Here's my cellular phone. You make some calls. I'm going to go down and get help. Maher realizes he needs to alert the police. I said, alarm, smoke alarm, oh, great. I took a piece of paper with my free hand and lit it. Smoke alarm going off, somebody's gonna be notified, they're gonna have to come. As police respond to the alarm, Maher stumbles down into the bank lobby on the first floor of the building. He tells the concierge that he's been attacked. I've been attacked. It should be you. It should be you. We need to see that book the concierge thought he was shot. So the concierge told the police one man had been shot. So the police thought there were terrorists inside. After Ted Maher tells police what's happened, paramedics rush him to the Princess Grace Hospital. 
By 5 a.m., sleepy Monaco is awakened by the sound of dozens of fire and police vehicles surrounding the Belle Epoque building. There was a panic, a total panic. Edmund Safra's chief bodyguard, Shmula Cohen, arrives from another Safra estate nearby and rushes to save his boss. And so he tried to go up. He was stopped. I need to go upstairs. No, no. Because he said, did not know what is this man. He might be one of the hostiles. Police scramble to figure out what's happening inside the penthouse apartment of the principality's wealthiest resident. Their first move, a floor-by-floor -floor search for the assailants, working from the basement up. Meanwhile, Ted Maher's small trash can fire begins to rage. Fire burned through the waste paper basket, burned along the floor, burned up the walls. Fearing that the intruders are still inside, police won't let firefighters into Safra's apartment. Smoke begins to filter into the bathroom. Safra and Torrente telephone for help. Waking to the smoke alarm at 6 a.m., Lily Safra makes her own escape. But when she learns her husband is still inside, she tries to go back in. She was stopped by the policeman. What could Madame Safra do against two intruders uh, with weapons and against the burning fire? We saw um, the fireman on the roof. We didn't see um, flames. We, we only saw uh, um, smoke. The billionaire and his nurse were barricaded in the bathroom like caged rabbits. I can only imagine the fear they endured. <laughs> Durante and Safra grow more panicked, and again they phone for help. They had spoke to Mrs. Safra first, to one of the other nurses who were in another hotel, and even the police. Please send someone here as soon. Oh, no. Over an hour after the ordeal began, officers still tell Safra to stay put. Help is on the way. <laughs> Unable to find the assailants, police finally allow firemen to enter the penthouse. Nobody could get in until 7.30. There was a lot of chaos and shouting and, uh, you know, sort of French-style behavior. And finally, at 7.30, they got in. What did they find? They were both dead, Torrenti and Safra. The fire may have been out, but the smoke still hadn't cleared on this bizarre case. How had two knife-wielding assassins gotten into and out of the Safra penthouse without detection? Someone clearly had a lot of explaining to do. Billionaire banker Edmund Soffer and one of his nurses have died in the mysterious fire. The biggest question on investigators' minds, what became of the intruders whose alleged break-in prompted nurse Ted Maher to set that fatal fire? There were two attackers. My brother had fought them off, tried to save his boss and the other nurse and Mrs. Safra, and he was a hero. Detectives question Ted Maher about his assailants, and he tells them everything he can remember. Uh, attacking, uh, stabbing. Dressed in black, 
They were big, six foot plus. The way the man whipped out that knife, you could tell that he was professionally trained. I mean, this wasn't some thug that was just in there to steal some rich painting. You could see that he knew what he was doing. Yeah. Monaco, long considered a safe haven for the ultra-rich, is reeling in the wake of the attack. One of the aspects of what Monaco is, it's a place where there's no violence of any kind, even suicide. It's all, if you like, part of the paradise myth. The great novelist Somerset Maugham once described Monaco as a sunny place for shady people. There are no bums, no panhandlers, and barely any violent crime in this nation that's smaller than Central Park in New York. But the Safra attack threw into question just how safe the residents of Monaco really were. There were a number of groups who would have benefited by the death of Edmund Safra. He had recently made headlines for negotiating to sell his Republic National Bank for $3 billion. Men like Safra don't have average enemies. His bank was involved in the Contra arms deals. He's one of Israel's largest contributors. So the PLO or the Islamic Jihad or one of these groups certainly would benefit having him out of the way. Safra Bank was involved in the Russian money laundering operation that the Justice Department uh, was investigating. They were cooperating. Police learn Safra's wife, Lily, will inherit the lion's share of his $2.5 billion fortune at the expense of Edmund's brothers. Edmund Safra's will was changed approximately two weeks before his death, either taking out the brothers or limiting of their inheritance. But Lily came into the marriage with hundreds of millions of her own, and by all accounts, she and Edmund had a strong relationship. Investigators quickly rule out the possibility that she had anything to do with the death of her husband. They lived a spectacular life. Edmund Safra and Lily had an apartment in one of the most beautiful uh, historic buildings on Fifth Avenue. I'd only seen Edmund and Lily Safra once at the opera. But even from afar, I could feel the aura of their extraordinary wealth. It was hard to fathom such an ignoble ending to their fairy tale existence. In London, they had two townhouses bumper to bumper on Eaton Square, and they owned La Leopold, built for the King of Belgium, which is on the market now for $265 million. Detectives continue their investigation of the gutted penthouse, but find no sign of forced entry, nor any glimpse of the attackers on surveillance cameras. So how could a pair of armed intruders enter one of the most heavily fortified buildings in Monte Carlo and simply disappear? And where was Safra's security detail? Walking around his estate, you know, every bush that I looked around, there was a guy there with an Uzi. Edmund Safra lived virtually surrounded by a private army of bodyguards, many of them veterans of the Mossad, the Israeli intelligence agency. But not one of the guards was on duty the night Edmund died. Back in the hospital, police question Maher again. This time they delve into his background, trying to understand what motivated him to journey all the way to Monte Carlo. My mother was a, a school bus driver. My father was a telephone repairman. And uh, it was a very, very strict family, a very, very rigorous family, disciplined family, um, the oldest of five children. Um, we didn't have a whole lot growing up, but we had what we needed. And, um, but anything that we wanted to get, we, we had to work for. After serving in the army and going to nursing school, Maher became a highly regarded neonatal nurse in New York City. One day, the parents of a set of twins he took care of recommended him for a job with their friend, Edmund Safra. There is something almost unbelievable in the journey that took Ted Maher 
from tending preemies to joining the inner sanctum of one of the richest men in the world. Maher's background was as humble as the Safra's was grand. Ted had never been exposed to a, a life like this before. This was truly a, a dream come true for a private nurse. But now, with his boss dead and two knife wounds to the abdomen, Maher's dream has come crashing down. Lily Safra flies Ted's wife, Heidi, from New York to Monaco to be by her husband's side. But police have other business with Mrs. Maher. Heidi was interrogated for two or three hours by the police. She asked to go for a cup of coffee. She got outside and a car pulled up. She didn't know they were police. Three men shove Heidi into a van and drive to the hotel where Ted lived. By abducting her and taking her to the room, they were able to conduct a search of the room under Monaco law. The search turns up a vial of xylocaine, an anesthetic that Ted was never prescribed. The discovery leads police to question Ted's credibility. Heidi suddenly realizes police no longer consider her husband the hero of this story. They're treating him like a suspect. She calls Ted's sister, Tammy, to tell her what's happened. She was crying. She said that she had been kidnapped by people in a van with masks on. She told me that she had been brought to Ted's apartment, and the nightmare began. In the days after the Safra attack, speculation swirled. Was it the Russian Mafia, Chechen rebels, the PLO? Monaco's chattering classes were shocked to find out that the prime suspect was an average American guy living right under their noses. Four hours after the deaths of Edmund Safra and his nurse Vivian, panicked investigators have learned nothing about the armed attackers who allegedly snuck into the Safra penthouse. To Heidi Maher's horror, suspicion has suddenly turned to her injured husband. Madame Mayer left New York thinking that she was going to meet her husband, a hero. And the time that she flew to Monaco, the hero was not a hero, but a criminal. The stabbing story was very dubious because he was wearing, I think, a woolen sweater or something of the kind, and curiously, he'd been stabbed without the knife penetrating the uh, woolen sweater. There were no holes in the sweater, only in his skin. Police also discovered that the knife recovered in the lobby of the Belle Epoque building may be the same make and model as a knife Maher owned. He stabbed himself with his own knife. Of course, you can say, I had a knife, my knife was robbed by the intruder, he stabbed me, and he gave it back to me again because the knife was found next to him. So imagine the, the logic. Detectives repeatedly visit Ted Maher. They asked me this way, they asked me that way, they asked me every which way, and I told them the same thing. They tell Maher that he's behind the deaths of Safra and Torrente. First thing I did is I started crying, and uh, you know I consider myself a pretty strong person, but you know I, I couldn't believe that uh, you know I, I'd been responsible for for the death of, of a human being. Police lay out the evidence against Maher, and finally, in his fifth round of questioning, he tells them exactly what they want to hear. He say, "I'm going to tell you the truth. The truth is, I was alone in the apartment." with Mr. Safra and Mrs. Torrente, and I wounded myself. Ted Meyer told the police that he had <coughs> organized a fake assault, put the fire to start a panic, and that all was uh, fake. He wanted to appear like a hero to his boss. Maher is discharged from the hospital and taken to police headquarters. They've heard his story. Now all they need is a signed confession. 
they'd got his wife's passport as leverage. They presented his passport and said, well, your wife is here. Here's a picture of your children. We know they're real small. And their mother's not going to see them for a very long time. Ted Maher feels like the future of his family is in the balance. This police investigator told me I had to sign this, otherwise my wife would not be released. And I signed it because I had no choice. I did what I had to do for the safety and love of my family. Just three days after the fatal fire, as Edmund Soffer is laid to rest in Geneva, Monaco's chief prosecutor holds a press conference to announce the arson charges against Ted Maher. For him, Mr. Safra was an employer excellent. He wanted simply to attract attention on his person. Madame Safra couldn't believe it. It was total stupefaction. Why? Why? For what reason? What circumstances can lead a man to do that? When I heard about Ted's confession, I was immediately skeptical. In no time, the case had been all tied up with a neat bow, the guilty party was in custody, and Monaco was safe once more. But had Maher really stabbed himself and started the blaze just to make himself seem heroic in the eyes of Edmund Safra? Allow me not to be cynical, but a bit more concrete. What he was searching was not so much the love of Edmond Safra, but the reward of Edmond Safra. And please do not doubt that if things had happened the way he said he wanted them to happen, that is a danger, and then Ted Maher saving Edmond Safra from the danger, he would have been rewarded in such a way that he could have retired for the rest of his life. The Monaco prison is the Hotel de Paris of prisons. It was air conditioned. Ted had a view of the Mediterranean. He had a refrigerator. He had a three quarter bed. He had a place to sit and write. When I was there one day, they brought the food up and the first course was avocado vinaigrette. And the second course was a local Mediterranean fish in a bear blanc sauce. For two years, Maher languishes in Monaco's luxurious prison. He's brought before investigators nine times, and each time he sticks to the story in his confession. But in his own mind, he knows there were intruders, even if no one else saw them. Can you imagine you knowing the truth and having people calling you a murderer and an assassin and a contract killer and all these allegations running out there, and you can't defend yourself? The trial is finally set for November 21st, 2002. Heidi Maher brings American lawyer Michael Griffith onto the case. Ted insisted that he was stabbed. I explained to him that I could help him uh, possibly get the confession overturned. My gut feeling was that the truth shall set you free. But he felt because of the legal advice that he'd been getting, he would not be believed at this point I was convinced an innocent man was being railroaded by a government that couldn't live with an unsolved crime in their perfect little principality. Now that Ted Maher was finally getting his day in court, I headed back to Monte Carlo to get the inside story. It's fall in Monaco, and American nurse Ted Maher is about to face trial after almost three years in prison. Maher's been told he'll only get a light sentence for starting the fire that killed Edmund Safra and Vivian Torrente. But just before the trial, his lawyers deliver some bad news. Donald Mattis and George Watt came to the prison and say, Ted, we have a serious problem. The procurer is asking for 12 years. I said, what, are you out of your mind? For what? Arson and the death of two persons. I'm being blamed for this entire tragedy? It's, it's not possible. That's when I knew I was in some serious trouble. Adding to Maher's woes, the judge rules that his American lawyer, Michael Griffith, can't plead in court. Michael Griffith? I was told that Michael Griffith could not preside, that they would not tolerate Anglo-Saxon justice in the courtroom. 
On November 21st, 2002, the trial kicks off. And all of Monte Carlo is watching. You, you don't have a trial like that in what I call never. It was the trial of the century, the Grand Prix of the trials, with very brilliant lawyers, with this Safra family, which is something to see, and with this Ted Maher, who's like uh, uh, Forrest Gump or something. <laughs> so it was totally uh, uh, um, surrealistic. The trial took place in the Palais de Justice in Monaco which is just what you'd expect a courthouse in Monaco to look like. It was very regal and almost looked like a church hanging behind the, the judges. There was a six-foot Jesus on the cross. Every seat was taken. There was press there from all over the world. Dominic Dunn had one of the best seats in the courthouse. Chief Prosecutor Sir Day wore a, uh, a big red regal robe with sashes hanging. We lawyers wore black robes with white sashes. It was quite the scene. Maher's defense team argues that he never meant to hurt anyone. It was our position that Ted, by lighting the fire, at the very most, was guilty of involuntary manslaughter. He didn't purposely light a fire to hurt Mr. Safra. <laughs> Under Monaco law, Lily Safra, as the victim's spouse, was entitled to participate in the prosecution. Prince Charles referred her to Mark Boland, the brilliant British PR person. Boland suggested she wear a 25-year-old Yves Saint Laurent pantsuit and leave her jewelry at home. But there was no escaping that Lily Safra was the star of the show. She brought counsel in from Switzerland, Marc Bonnard, an expensive lawyer, George Cageman, the former justice minister of France. They all stayed in suites at the Hotel de Paris, one of the most expensive hotels in the world. But imagine uh, she had to spend up to a million dollars on her prosecution of Ted. Monaco and its ruling family also have a stake in the outcome. A thing like that can't happen in Monaco. That's why the rich people come here. And if you begin to say that you can be murdered in your apartment in the center of Monaco, that the police uh, won't come, that the fireman, if there's a fire, won't break in, uh, you, you take your money and run. Against Lily Safra's riches and the vast wealth of the Monaco government, Maher has almost no resources of his own. I knew that uh, you know I was in a really bad situation, and I knew that uh, they had held all the cards in this game that I were playing. But you know, unfortunately, it was my life that they were playing with. There was 19 attorneys in this courtroom. 19. Can you imagine? Unfortunately, not one of them was representing Ted Maher. A couple of days into the trial, Joseph Citroux, the Grand Rabbi of France, arrives in court as a witness for his dead friend, Edmund Safra. Monaco law allows the accused, Ted Maher, to directly question witnesses. When the questions went around the courtroom, nobody had anything to say to this rabbi, but I did. And naturally, right out of my heart, I asked the rabbi to say a prayer in this courtroom for Mr. Safra and Vivian Toronto. Ted's question was so bizarre that I began to wonder whether he was all there. The rabbi started chanting in Hebrew, and the judges, jurors, witnesses, and lawyers all rose and bowed their heads. It was an astonishing and surreal moment. Maher's lawyers take aim at the police and fire department for botching the emergency response. One of my cross-examinations concerned a police officer, the first on the scene, who said that Ted had been shot. I asked him, 
have you ever seen a gunshot wound before? And he said, no. I said, have you ever seen a knife wound before? And he said, no. I said, how long have you been on the Monaco Police Department? He says, 22 years. I said, well, what's the worst wound you've ever seen? He said, well, one time, one guy hit another guy over the head with a champagne bottle. The defense contends that police and firemen could have saved Edmund Safra if only rescuers had gone in sooner. The prosecutor, Serde, who always says strange things, he said they acted with a necessary slowness. Now, what could that mean? A necessary slowness when it led to two deaths. But that's what he said in open court. The person who touched people in the courtroom most was Heidi Maher. Her love for her husband and belief in him had never wavered. She sat in the row in front of me, never taking her eyes off her husband in the dock. Well, my wife was there for the trial, and unfortunately, that was she wasn't there because, you know, I had to be so convincing in the trial, it convinced her. The more Ted talked, the more I began to doubt his story. It wasn't anything you could put your finger on. Sometimes he had a faraway look. Then he'd give an answer that rambled on a little too long. By the end of the trial, I'd ceased to completely believe him. At the beginning, when we were discussing with Ted, of course, in the purpose of his defense, he was acting like a normal person. But time passing by, the eyes of Ted were suddenly something bizarre. The way he talked, the way he explained, you can see he's crazy. Something is not normal inside. Uh, but he looks like a nice guy. After 10 days of testimony, Ted Maher's fate is in the hands of three jurors and three judges. I was told to leave the courtroom after 12 days of trial. I went out there, had time to go to the toilet, have a sip of water, and 45 minutes had gone by, and I was told to come back. One of the French papers referred to the defendant as Dr. Ted and Mr. Maher, a play on Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. It did seem as if Ted were two people in one. I wondered which Ted Maher the judge would pass judgment on, the loving father and caring nurse, or the deeply troubled soul I had glimpsed at this trial. After a short time deliberating, the jury in the Ted Maher case returns to the courtroom to announce their verdict. I was like, I can't believe this. You don't have time to deliberate 45 minutes. This is one of the biggest trials in Monaco's history. And then the president read from a paper that was obviously done way in advance for an hour and 20 minutes. I was condemned for 10 years, and that the decision was 4-2 against me. Heidi Maher used my cell phone to call her mother in upstate New York. All she said was, guilty, 10 years, tell the kids. As she handed back the phone, I could see she was crying. I have a sympathy for that woman who comes to take in her arms somebody that she could worship and love, and that finds out that he's just a very vulgar criminal. In a strange flourish, Ted publicly apologized to the Safra and Torrente families. Heidi told me later she felt like standing up and saying, what about me and our children? The marriage had clearly reached the breaking point. She gave up. She was sick of the whole thing. She was sick of the media. She was sick of fighting so hard. And she just wanted to move on with her life. And she felt like he was guilty. It hurt so bad. 
I, um, <clears throat> I still love her. Heidi decides to leave Ted. Now the American nurse faces 10 long years in jail. They were trying to force me to kill myself, literally, because they made things so miserable. But I just kept going. I wouldn't do it, because I knew one day I would be out. There was more to the story to be told. Had I ended my life, I would never be able to tell the truth. Just eight weeks into his incarceration, Monaco has moved on from Ted Maher, and Ted Maher is just about done with Monaco. He and his cellmate, Italian thief Luigi Ciardelli, begin collaborating on an escape plan. If you were to see the several layers of bars, there would be no way physically anyone could get through there. And for anyone to even think about going out the window is just inconceivable. Night after night, Maher secretly saws away at his bars with a smuggled-in hacksaw blade. After weeks of cutting and concealment, he and his cellmate finally make a break. They tied some sheets, like in old films, and they get out of the prison by the window. We didn't hear <laughs> of a prison break in Monaco, never, never. The night of January 21st, 2003, the night of my sister's birthday, I escaped. The person that was in my cell abandoned me once his feet hit the ground. I made my way through Monte Carlo and said good evening to three policemen as I walked out of that place and then walked very, very fast and, and made it to Nice, France. I checked into a two-star hotel telling the man that my car broke down. He called me and he said, Hello, happy birthday. My car broke down. I have the concierge uh, needs a credit card number so I can get a motel room. I, I've lost everything and I need some help. So what could I do? I gave him the credit card number. And, and then I was very worried. I checked in under alias and there's over a million people in that town and there was no way they could, they could find me. No way. I was shocked. Ted's great escape was the first prison break in Monaco in more than 50 years. But I had to wonder, how long could he last on the lam in a country where he had no money, no friends, and couldn't speak the language? In an incredible twist to the Edmund Safra story, convicted felon Ted Maher has broken out of the Monaco prison. He checks into a Nice hotel and tries to plan his next move. During the night, I had contacted my wife, Heidi, who didn't want to help me at that point. Heidi calls Ted's lawyers in Monaco to find out what's going on. They, in turn, contact prison authorities who quickly dismiss the accusation. Oh, it's just a rumor. They're in their bed. We just go through every hour. They're there sleeping. It's just a rumor. Maher calls a local priest who's been holding some cash for his prison expenses. I said, Father Ball, I need the money that my family's given you. He says, Ted, call me in the morning. morning, I called and spoke to Father Peter Ball. Father Peter Ball said, the man you want is on the phone. Maher suddenly realizes the police are with the priest. Ted Maher makes a run for it. I got my things together, went downstairs. There was five French nationals waiting for me. I'd been betrayed by my wife, by my attorney, and by a priest. It doesn't get any better than that. Maher is arrested and eventually extradited back to Monaco. Once again, he's on trial in Monaco's Palace of Justice, this time for the prison break. I went to the trial of his escape, and I found that Ted Bahel had not changed. Once again, his system of defense 
It's not me, it's the others. The number of things that happen unwillingly to that man creates a bit of compassion. He kills unwillingly, he escapes unwillingly. Does he live unwillingly? As punishment for his escape, Maher gets another year tacked on to his 10-year sentence. Maher struggles to cope with his long jail sentence. He's a tough son of a bitch. And he has a stronger faith in God than I do. As I continued to follow the case, I heard that a new Ted Maher was emerging in prison. He was no longer the forlorn, slightly mad figure he seemed at trial. Now he was going public to assert his innocence. In August 2007, Ted Maher is released from jail in Monaco after serving out his sentence. He immediately returns to America, eager to see his children and begin a new life as a free man. Plane landed. I felt like part of my heart was replaced. I was afraid that he would be damaged as a person. He's not. He's still the same pain in the butt, great brother. Very happy that he's home. Well, the first thing after I did, after getting on a plane in eight hours, I, I was served a subpoena for the restraining order. <laughs> Not to be able to see the children and my wife, I guess she panicked, realizing I was finally going to come out alive. I still to this day haven't seen my children. I'm still fighting to see my children. Ted Maher was wrongfully charged and condemned for something he, he didn't do. There are people that that did gain from the death of Mr. Edmund Safra, and um, and those people know who they are, and they know what they did, and they know what they didn't do. Any story which comes from the Monegasque authorities, any version which they validate, is almost certainly basically untrue. I think this is something which is going to remain as part of the, the great Monaco story. And I don't think we'll ever get the truth. Ted Mayer was the cause of two deaths. Things are very simple. Even today, I have persons knowing that I've been the lawyer during that case who, who take me aside and with a very accomplished look tell me, but Mark, do you really believe that it's only that? Yes, I really believe. Not only I believe, I know rationally uh, that it's only that. I originally believed Ted Maher was a victim. Then I thought perhaps he was deeply disturbed. Now, eight years later, all I know is that the real truth of what happened that night has gone with Edmund Safra to his grave. For True TV, I'm Dominic Dunn.